Hi, this video will be the first of two or three videos about the development of a Tetris-like game. This current video will not have any implementation, I will just explain the logic I used to make it and so you can try to remake it in any engine or language if you want, or you can just keep watching it if you are curious about it. I didn't search to any Tetris implementation before I started, so I have no idea if this is a good or bad way to do this, but it is kind of working and I learned a lot during the process, so it was worth it. I say kind of working because I didn't pay attention to the little details of a normal Tetris game. But let's start. The first step was defining the major structure of the game. So I decided to create a major game area and inside it a shapes area. This shapes area is the place where the shapes can drop and move and make everything shapes do. Then, of course, we need a shape. I decided to create a generic shape with the common actions a shape can do and extend it later with different shapes. So we can have a generic shape without form and multiple shapes with forms extending it. And to finish everything I decided to create an extra object called block. And that is the block. Or better, there are four blocks. So all shapes will be composed by these blocks. I decided to make this in this way, because the blocks will have the same responsibilities in any shape. So the same block will be reused to build all shapes. So we will basically just need these four parts to build our game. The full game object that holds everything. Here we can later put things like an next shape reviewer, a points counter, but these are not important at the moment. Our main interest is the game area, or shapes area, where the game really occurs. Inside the game area we have the shapes, and inside the shapes we have the blocks. Now that our structure is defined, let's take a deeper look at our objects. The two first objects are basically containers to define the general game area and the area with the shapes, so as they have nothing special, I will not lose time with them at the moment. Let's start with the other two objects. But before we start to look inside the objects, let's see how the shapes will keep the blocks and manage the rotation. To do that I decided to use a matrix to hold the position of every block at any point of the rotation. It can seem a bit confusing at the first look, but it's simple once you are used to it, and it makes it really simple to add new shapes, and has an extra bonus that as we are not really rotating the blocks, we can create all kind of behaviors, like an object that switches between the shapes or observe shapes. But let's see an example. Let's say this is our shape 1. First, we have to define a rotation block. This will be the 0, 0 point and the other blocks will rotate around this block. Now, we have to define the position of the other blocks compared to this one. So, the first block in this shape will be at the position minus 1, 0 because it is at the left of our center block and at the same y level. Following the same logic, the other two blocks will be at position 1, 0 and 2, 0. And now that we have the positions of our blocks in our first shape, we can add it to our matrix. So, for now, our matrix starts with this. But we need to define the block positions to the other rotations too, so let's do it. And so we can repeat the same process, first defining the 0, 0 block, and then the difference to the other blocks. And then we can add the positions to our matrix. And if you want, you can change the 0, 0 position at the matrix to change the rotation point. And we keep rotating the shape and getting the positions to put it in our matrix. And so, now we have all the positions of our first shape. Maybe it seems like a lot of stuff to do, but it's all we have to do to add an extra shape. Now, to add other shapes, we just need to repeat the same logic. First we define the start position of the shape, and then we define all the other rotation positions. And repeat it until we have all the matrices defined. So, as the other shapes are just made with the same process, I will spare your time and just put the final matrices of every shape I used 
and you can just remake the process if you want to change something or add an extra shape. Now we can take a look inside our block. First, the block has an isActive variable. This variable is used to determine if the block can be moved or not. Blocks that become inactive will be put in a matrix with its position, so that we know where they are and where to collide with them. As all blocks need to have access to the same matrix, it needs to be a global variable or something similar. And as we will never have lonely blocks in this game, once the block inactives itself, it need to inform the entire shape so that all the blocks on the shape can inactive themselves. And to finish this function, it has to check if after the inactivation of the block, we have a full line so that we can destroy it. Now let's see the other functions. Our block need to have the ability to check if it can be moved to a given direction. We can divide it in multiple functions if we want. So it will basically check the matrix and the game screen to see if it can move. The block need to be able to check if it can rotate too. It basically checks the matrix and the screen again. Then, to finish, let's take a look again at our check full line function. This function takes the y position of the current inactivated block and checks if in the matrix of the inactive blocks is a number of blocks equal to the maximum number of blocks per line. So, if your game is 20 blocks high by 10 blocks width, we need to check if there are 10 blocks with a given y to know that there is a full line in this position. If there is a full line, we need to destroy the line. To do that, first we can erase all the blocks with this line at the matrix. And then we need to shift the blocks above down. We can do that increasing the position of all blocks with the y position smaller than the value of the destroyed line with the block height. Now let's see how the shape works. I will name it shape0 because it is the shape that doesn't have a body. It will just have the functions and the other shapes will extend it. First, our shape will have a draw function so that it can draw itself in a different way depending on what type of shape it is. This function will just get all the blocks that are children of this shape and draw them at the given positions. Then we need a function to rotate the shape. This function needs to check if all children can rotate and if so, we can rotate all of them, or rotate the shape. And the logic of the other functions are similar. If a block calls the inactivate function, we need to loop through all the children and inactivate them. Now we can create a variable to check if the shape can be moved. To move the shape to the right or to the left, we check if the shape can be moved. Then loop through the children and look if all of them can move to the direction, and if so, we move the shape. And to finish our shape, we need to create the move down function. This function starts setting a new variable with the start position. After that, it checks if all children can move down. If all can move down, the shape is moved. If not, we need to make a check to see if the actual position is equal to the start position variable. If the actual position is equal to the start position, it's game over. And then, to finish our game, we have the shapes area. The shapes area just manages the timer to respawn and move the shapes, and the input handler, to manage our inputs. And so guys, this is the logic of our Tetris game. In the next video I will show how I implemented it with Godot engine, but the logic is generic, so you can reuse it in any engine or just with code. If you enjoyed the video, please consider subscribe, give a thumbs up, leave a comment, and thank you for watching, bye!